What's going on everyone? It's Bales and welcome back to another episode of AFL Fantasy Head to Head where we put two players up against one another to see who we'll be picking in 2024. This is episode 10. If you haven't caught up with the other nine episodes, make sure you guys go and uh, watch all those either on the YouTube channel or as podcasts wherever you get your podcasts as well. And make sure you uh, subscribe on the YouTube and then follow and uh, all that good stuff on the podcast formats. Joining me is another special guest, as we have on everyone. It is the uh, man you know as a stats guru, um, and he's uh, very influential on your uh, X slash Twitter. Um, it is Jane Papowski, stats man. Mate, how are you? Good, Bows. Thanks for having me on. It's great to be here, and I'm pretty excited for this discussion. Um, after suggesting it, I was a little bit like, okay, I've, I've just suggested it, but I've gone and I've done the research, and it's, it's very close. It's very close. Yes. Yeah. Yep, exactly right. And that duo that we will be chatting about is Harry Sheasel versus Liam Duggan, which uh, you look at both, both older players have left the back lines. There's more uh, kickouts potentially available for them, more ball in the back line. But also there's uh, chances that they both play midfield. So that is why it's actually a really good combo. And they're actually very, very similarly priced. So I'm just getting up their prices now um, while my page is zoomed in a little bit too far. So... Um, Harry Sheasel is currently priced 878k and Liam Duggan is priced 869k. So really, really close together, which is uh really, really good. I'll be taking Harry Sheasel um and Jane will be taking Liam Duggan. I'll go with Harry Sheasel first, being the more expensive player, which is the format that we follow through all of the episodes. So Harry Sheasel um sort of burst out of the blocks um last year in his very first season with Look, this first four games is pretty – first five games really is pretty ridiculous. Uh, 118, 127, 109, 119. For a rookie, that is ridiculous. 96, got a 47 against Gold Coast, fired up with a 126, 98, 81, 112. So a very good first 10 weeks with only one really poor score. We did see, however, in the back portion of – back half of the year, there were a few more of those – scores that you'd probably typically associate with a rookie. So we saw like a 64 against the Bombers, a 52 against uh, the Cats, a 53 against Melbourne. We, we did still see some big scores in there, especially after his bye, 106 against the Crows, 112 against Hawthorne, 116 against St Kilda, 110 against Essendon, and 129 against Richmond. So very, very good first year. Coming into his second year, the positive for him, firstly, is the fact that both Aaron Hall and Jack Siebel are both not going to be, uh, obviously, both uh, moved on and retired. So there's a lot more ball back there, more kick-ins. He was already taking um, a decent amount of kick-ins, but he was essentially taking 50-50. Uh, him and Jack Siebel were splitting it. He'll get the lion's share. If he, the, the big thing is if he's got this main distributor role. So I'm going to talk as if he does. So if he's got this main distributor role, I think he's going to be a good pick uh, in our defence in 2024 because there's going to be just that much more, more ball back there. While also North Melbourne, um, another year into their development, a few more, a few new faces in the side like Isaac Fishers and Kyle McCurchis, which could be a good thing or a bad thing. We'll uh, see in a few other rookies getting extra pre season, like George Wardlaws and Sheasel himself. So, as North Melbourne improved, he should improve as well. The the flags, Jaden, I, I want to go to you for this point is we've heard Zach Fisher has been recruited, and a lot of us are anticipating that he and Matt Sims and pre season so far suggest he'll be playing off half back and being. One of the main distributors back there. And then Kyle McCurch has also been rumoured um, to be going back in defence. Where do you see Harry Sheasel fitting? Do you see him as a defender and still being the main distributor? Maybe Fisher's the second guy there. Or do you see it maybe being more of the fact that Sheasel will be playing in the midfield um, and, and getting a bit more of a go there and then maybe splitting Tom forward? How do you see his uh, role going in 2024? Yeah, the Kangaroos are certainly a massive talking point this preseason. We've plenty of players that you know are potential options and I guess that's what happens when older players move on and they've got a pretty young brigade and especially in fantasy classic where we're looking at those cheaper price players um Shizu is he's a very good player and maybe that can mean that he'll be thrown around a little bit more I think a lot of a lot of prospective coaches at the moment are looking to um Feel that D1 with someone that are thinking about Dacos last year, whether Sheasel is kind of in that mould, starting a massive year off half back, and then potentially he can do that same kind of role, but then um, a little bit of midfield time. I'm not sure if that's going to be there for him. Um, but yeah, you never know. He's a very good player. Um, 
but I am a little bit concerned with how many players North Melbourne have lost out of that defense. And maybe, I know he's not that experienced, but he's a very experienced head, I think, with his ball movement and stuff like that. So I think he could end up a bit more in defense. There's a few injuries. Obviously, Zebo and Hall have moved on. Um, and yeah, if he does go into that midfield, he's competing with other players. And we haven't really seen that so much from him. Um, I think a lot of his scoring came from, you know, that halfback area. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be difficult. And I think maybe coaches are looking for that next ACOS. They want that role where they can go inside and, and outside. Um, that would be ideal. It's just whether, you know, if, is he too good of a player to be, um, you know, constantly in, in both places at once or do they just settle him into a solidified role? Yeah. Yeah, I fully agree with that. And then the other the other flag as well for Sheezel I have is is, is the tag. Um, I think when you look at North Melbourne, I think uh, LDU and, and Sheezel were probably the two at the top of the list. But I do look at it and and sometimes I'm probably going to look at LDU and think he's, he's quite hard to stop. Like he's he's very he can do both inside and outside. He's 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 got great agility. He's very hard to tackle. So I just don't know if many teams are going to go are going to go. Oh, we can shut LDU down. I think Sheezer was a lot easier to shut down being inexperienced. He's got a predominantly outside role um, at this early stage of his career, whether he can expand that into a more inside, maybe as a midfielder later in his career, obviously we get to see that. So is that another flag for you that you might be worried about is that if he is, especially if he's playing in defense, maybe they just get almost as they, as David King, I know lost Sun Fox, where you just put the worst player on, on, your, on the opposition team, put on the, on the, on the player that you're going to tag. Maybe they put like a defensive forward role on him if he's got that distributor, and if he's playing midfield, he gets taken. Is that is that a bit of a concern for you? Yeah, I I think it's more of a concern because he hasn't um, developed that inside game yet. So sometimes we see with players getting tagged, like maybe it's Sinclair or maybe it's Stakos. Players like this, they'll if they're under the tag, they might go into the midfield to try and free them up because. Like you said, if the opposition's worst player is on you, you want to try and expose them in the midfield, um, not just running around getting cheapies. Um, Sheezel scored a lot of points from transition last year and not so many from stoppages. He did get a little bit of midfield time, but um, if he's going to be playing that transition role, that can be shut down a lot easier yeah. than... Um, as in, like, you don't need such a high-quality tagger to be following yeah. someone around on the outside. You just need someone who can run. But yeah. if you're trying to put someone on him in the midfield, that's where he could be dangerous. Um, and, you know, obviously going into his second year, it's, it's going to be more likely that he spends time in the midfield than in his first year. But he didn't quite have the scoring in the midfield that I probably would have liked. Um, and he was still scoring a lot from transition, just looking through the numbers. So a lot of his points. So early on in the year, he was probably around 90-ish points from transition. Um, and yeah, even in those big games at the end, he was still doing that. So it seems like his score is very dependent on transition. He doesn't have that, you know, flaw from playing midfield all the time. Um, so yeah, the tag is a bit of a worry for me because that can fluctuate. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. But then on the other hand, maybe, I know some people have said as well, maybe with North Melbourne being towards sort of the bottom sort of half of the table, maybe teams don't necessarily take it. And me and Minnie Monk had this discussion a bit as well, actually on the Rosie and, and Butters episode that we were saying that I, th I think us at fantasy community probably do it as well, but just in general, I think the tag is a little bit overblown um, is that Finn McGuinness is really the main one. Like we've seen, funny enough, we actually saw a few taggers moved on, Like Ryan Clark at Sydney tagged a lot. He's now no longer there. Ed Kerno tagged a bit for Carlton. He's obviously retired. So, they're the, they're the main ones. Obviously, Aish was tagging. He's now probably going to be out of the midfield. Hayden Young's going to be in. Does Hayden Young, he's more of a run with player, not really a tag per se. And obviously, you've got Willem Drew there at Port as well that can do a role. But with Port's mid, uh, young midfield, I expect them to get the majority of the work there. So I don't know if we're going to see too many tags this year. So maybe Femius is the one. Maybe he goes to Sheezel and shuts him down. So the upside, I think, for Sheezel is there if he doesn't get the attention and if he's that main distributor role. But a few unknowns for me as well, because um, we don't know the role. If he's in the midfield, can he score um, up with the best uh, sort of defenders there? So I'm really intrigued to see that. But another guy 
that we sort of don't quite know what role he's going to play if he's going to be defence or midfield is Liam Duggan of West Coast. So, uh, Jaden, mate, throw now to you. Why should people be looking at Liam Duggan as a potential option, 20 foot, 24, as a pod as well, not highly owned either? Yeah, it's, it's a very similar discussion. They're very similar in price and, you know, that role uncertainty you just mentioned. Um, I guess something that drew me towards Duggan over Sheasel initially was the fact that Sheasel started the year really well and then kind of um, tampered off a little bit. But Duggan, the start of the year, he had three scores of 70 or under to start the year instead of Sheasel's 110s that he was pumping. And then after that, he's improved from there. So that's that's probably the first thing that I noticed. Um, and really around the middle of the year was when he had his massive scores he had a 140 and a 137, and yeah, I was pretty happy in my main draft league. I picked him up and maybe like D2 or D3, and yeah, that was elite. Um, but yeah, and then to finish the year, like he wasn't quite getting those hundreds again. He was 99, 83, 96, 95. So he's around about where he averaged, but then to finish the year, 112, 113. Um, and yeah, so. He improved his average quite a bit last year, um, and it means that, uh, you know, his price at that 96, while Sheezel is just above that, it's only the 9K difference. Um, but I think from for Duggan, he scored a lot of his points from kick-ins last year, and that's not necessarily from taking them, but also from receiving them and then just kick, like, Imagine Duggan takes a kick in, he kicks it to Hearn, and then Hearn kicks it back to him. He's just racking up easy points from that source. Sheasel didn't quite have that, so I'll just have a look at what um, what they did here. So um, Duggan was 22 points per game from kickings or receiving, but yep. Sheasel was um, down a bit. He was at 17, so that's five points a game difference. And I think with kick All, that, all that's up, though, five points. Yeah. Five points is pretty much the, the difference we could be looking at at the end of the year. Um, what that means, though, is is Duggan capped by that a little bit? Um, did he average too many points from kick-ins? And then if the Eagles slightly improve and they don't get scored against as much, does he have that ability to actually get the ball back on yep. transition? So obviously you see it a lot with these running half backs that have come into the game recently and become pretty popular fantasy. You think like Whitfield, Sinclair, players like this. Does Duggan have that same ability or is he more of a more of an actual defender um, compared to like yeah. what you would expect Sheasel to do with the handball receives, running past three points? Um, so yeah, Duggan, Duggan only um, did 54 points off opposition turnovers. And Sheasel did 53. So they're very similar there. Um, yep. Sheasel had a little bit more time around the ball. So that's why they averaged the same. But yeah, so whether Duggan is capped by that kick-ins, um, whether that just goes down because he averaged so many from that last year as the Eagles tried to stem the flow. But um, I think an interesting discussion point is the number one kick-in player last year was Shannon Hearn. So he did 27 points per game. So they were probably just kicking it to themselves back there. Um, and yeah, Witherden was sixth, so there's plenty of points back there. It's just whether they whether they keep it up. So that's that's easy points for Duggan. We probably want a little bit more from him in, from other sources, though. Like he was the most dependent player on kicking points last year. Um, we kind of want to see him push that 100 mark, which could mean he needs a little bit of midfield time, which he got a little bit last year. Um, and then, yeah, if he can get more involved in um, when the Eagles do win the ball back, trying to get it out of there. Um, but, yeah, for both of these players, there will be – it's pretty much down to – they're both in the bottom end of the ladder. There's going to be kick-ins available um, with Hearn, Zebel and Hall all retiring. Um, if they get it, that's a massive plus for them. Um, yeah. especially for Sheasel, who didn't didn't rely on that so much. You think of like, you know, Nick Dacos running back to take the kick in and then he goes back into the midfield, just that type of thirst 
Um, and yeah, North Melbourne didn't really didn't really turn over the ball that much. They waited for the opposition to kick it through the points before they got the ball back. Um, so there's plenty of points there. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I guess for Duggan is, does he need midfield time to be worth it? Because um, he is kind of, you know, he capped by that those points in defense a little bit. We know she's will probably get a little bit more time in the midfield from that. It's just whether he can handle it. So I think I am kind of leaning towards Duggan just because he's a bit more experienced. He's probably not going to get tagged. Um, and he does have those easy points from kick-ins. Um, and also with that better half of the back, better back half of the year. Um, and the Eagles need experience. They want the ball in his hands probably. Um, so yep. that's kind of where I'm leaning. I'm interested to know your thoughts on Duggan in particular. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, because obviously we're hearing of the last couple of days uh, from, from the time recording this is that um, looks sounds like Harley Reid is going to be sort of following a bit, a bit of a blueprint on Nick Dacos, Harry Shiz, where he starts at half back and, and might and might get floated around. So does, with him there, Brady Hoff will play a bit more back there as well. He was playing in defence last year, but him getting a bit more responsibility, obviously got with it in there as well. Does that allow a guy like Liam Duggan with a Luke Shuey retiring? Does that push him more into the midfield? So, again, it's a bit like Sheezer where there's a lot of a bit of questions about what role he's going to play because I think it's – it's I'm not sure if if, if, if midfield – I think midfield could be good for Duggan because we have seen he can rack up some tackles when he's played in defence there, but he can also rack up the marks when he's playing defence. It's almost like we want a bit of a, a role where he plays – half midfield, half in defence. So he goes in the midfield, rack up the tackles, get some touches, then go in defence and take some of those marks and play a little bit like what what Mitch Duncan's done some of that in the past. And, and we did see, we have seen some midfielders um, do that like and push back into defence and get a lot of marks. I remember one of my all-time favourites, Brent Stanton, used to do that a fair bit, push into defence and get a lot of marks. So does Duggan potentially have a role like that where he plays midfield but then does be almost like a defensive helper and, and go back there and get some marks. So I'm, I'm really intrigued to see um, what Ray does. And same with Sheezer as well, as we mentioned before, his role is, is very sort of, we don't quite know what it's going to do. The good thing about both these players, though, they don't have an opening round bye. So you get them for all of the games, except obviously the mid-season bye, um, which is good. So they play an extra game than those six teams um, that are yeah, uh, that are on, no, hang on, six teams? No, eight teams, sorry, that are on um, uh, opening round bye. So... Um, yeah, very interesting. And Duggan was only 4% owned as well. That's what I was going to say for. So quite uh, a pod pick compared to Sheezel, who uh, at the time of recording is uh, currently in a fair few more teams. Um, so he's currently sitting in 16.55% as well. So a bit more as well. Up sort of in the top sort of 10 to 15 defenders um, in terms of ownership stats there as well. And one of the more popular sort of premium picks, maybe, as you said, for people looking for that that Nick Dacos type uh, year. But time has come. You did allude to it a little bit before um, of who we're going to pick between uh, Liam Duggan and Harry Sheasel. So, um, Jaden, who are you picking out of uh, Harry Sheasel and Liam Duggan for 2024? I think unless I see a kind of definitive role for Sheasel, we saw him thrown around a bit last year, uh, I'm going to have to stick with Duggan at the moment. They're very similar. All their numbers I looked at so similar. Um, but I think I'm going to go with Duggan purely because um, I don't think she's all, like I, when I look at North Melbourne, I want to know who takes those kick-ins because they struggled for turnovers last year um, and then they got scored against. So they had kick-ins. If Zach Fisher is taking those kick-ins or if, I don't know, one of their key defenders ends up taking them. Or and the, it's not the coach, maybe. Yeah, gets that, that would be the dream. If she's always not taking them, I I just can't pick him really, um, yeah. because he, he 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 did get a few kicking points last year, but it's just probably not the right system for him to be in if he's not getting kicking points. Because North Melbourne really struggled to turn it over last year, but the Eagles did have a little bit more ball control in defence, um, so. I think with Hearn gone, Duggan can really step up and be that, you know, reliable type player. And then Witherden can be maybe a bit more attacking. 
that Duggan could really sit back in defence or otherwise if they need him in the midfield. But, yeah, I guess that's why I'm going for Duggan at the moment. I'm a little bit – got a few questions about Sheasel's role and whether, you know, he's going to be the main man at North Melbourne. There's a few other names being thrown around, but I think Duggan just has a bit more experience. He's a premiership player and, you know, they're going to need him. Yeah. I think I agree as well, um, which is uh, I'm, I don't think there've been two disagreements on any uh, of the uh, episodes so far, but I am agreeing with Duggan as well. I just think that his floor is probably higher. I think his bad games, I think in in a West Coast was side where he's not going to be the guy that's going to get tagged at all. I think his floor is probably like sixty, which a lot of defenders have got that floor of sixty. Um, and I think a lot he might have some games in seventies and eighties, but I think a lot of those he's going to have a lot of nineties. A lot of low hundreds, he's got the ability to go those 110s, 120s, and could even go more if he does have this this midfield role and maybe comes back and gets those plus six. Because if he can play midfield where we know that we have seen in limited games, he's been able to get tackles. If he can get marks as well, fill up the stat lines, that could really push him in that top uh, echelon. But both uh, players, I'm keen to see their roles. And, yeah, she's we just don't quite know um, his role yet. And and same for Duggan. But she's I think, is a bit more aligned on the role compared to what Duggan is as well. So... That'll do it for another head-to-head battle. Thank you very much, Jane, for jumping on. Let us know in the comments below uh, who you guys will be picking between Shizu and Duggan, if you pick neither, if you pick both. Let us know your, com- uh, your thoughts on either player or any other general questions. Put them in the comments below, below and we'll get to those when we can. But, Jade, mate, thank you very much for coming on, mate, making your debut on the channel on the Head to Head series, mate. Where can the people find you and all of the good stuff that you're doing with all your stats and that on uh, the socials. Yeah, thanks, Matt. It was a very interesting discussion. And, yeah, that's just so close, like everything. Yeah. Um, and there's a few other names around there as well, like Stuart and Whitfield that have been thrown up. They're just yeah. – I, I still need to decide on my D1. Um, but, yeah, everyone can find me on Twitter or X at Jaden underscore Popovsky. Um, That's where I do a lot of work. But trying to get the Instagram going as well. You can follow me there at Stats by Jaden. Um, so hopefully, if you prefer that platform, you can find my stuff there. Yeah, beautiful. Make sure you go and follow Jaden across the socials. Um, next episode, we've got another uh, one coming up. Uh, actually, before I do that, though, I keep forgetting to do this all the time because I've, I've uh, only just been a new thing. But, um, but all of the pod, uh, pods there are all going to be av- available as podcasts as well. So make sure you go... Uh, if you're not watching on YouTube, make sure you do go and uh, give them uh, a listen over on the podcast platforms, whether it be on Spotify, or Apple. And please, if you'd be so kind, give us a five-star rating and review. It's very much appreciated. It does help get the channel out and to more people. So it takes uh, less than a minute. So if you can help us uh, out with that, that'd be very much appreciated. Thanks, Jaden, again for jumping on. You can follow me at BalsDT on the socials as well. Make sure you do give the video a like and subscribe to the channel uh, and all that good stuff as well. And we'll catch you guys in the next one. So we're out. Cheers.